Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of John's Rants. A um, lot going on today in organized real estate. Uh, the upcoming rants and some of the other programs the association has will fill you in on what's going on with the antitrust lawsuits. But as I'm recording this, uh, a lot of stuff is, is happening and uh, all of it's big and all of it's important. Today, I'm going to just do a little deep dive and spend a little bit of time on an issue that comes up in almost every lawsuit, um, almost every ethics complaint, and that has to do um, with the issue of breaching your fiduciary obligation. So I want to spend just a little bit of time just to kind of give you a revisit on the topic. Hopefully you'll find it helpful. So what is the fiduciary duty? Um, what are we actually talking about? That's topic number one. Topic number two, who's this obligation, this duty owed to? How is it breached? And then lastly, when it is breached, what are the damages that we can expect? There's a jury instruction, and it's uh, it's pretty complicated, but the thrust of it is that uh, um, as a real estate broker, you have a duty to investigate certain things. You have a duty to provide the, the client with all the material information, not just facts that you uncover, but any information about the property or the transaction. Uh, you have a duty to either verify information or in the alternative, you have a fiduciary obligation to tell your client when information that's being passed on has not been verified by you, which is typical. A lot of times you're going to get information from a homeowners association, from a vendor, from a next door neighbor, from all kinds of sources. And you're going to tell your client what you discovered, what people told you uh, and all of that. And you're going to then tell them, you know, I, I, I don't have any way of verifying this information or I'm not qualified to verify this information. Uh, and then, of course, hopefully you'll you'll do that in, in writing. So the fiduciary duty basically um, is an obligation that imposes upon the, the agent, in this case, the real estate or agent or broker, it imposes on you a, a, an extreme duty of care. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect every time, but be cautious. Uh, a duty of care means keeping up on things that are going on in your industry, reading the forms, understanding how to explain them. It means Loyalty. It's a very difficult concept uh, uh, when you're representing both sides to a transaction. We're not going to cover dual agency today. We'll do that the next time, part two of this program. But but again, if you're going to be loyal, who are you going to be loyal to? If I'm only representing the seller, piece of cake. I'm loyal to the seller so long as what we're doing is truthful and honest. If I'm representing the buyer, I'm going to be loyal to the buyer so long as I'm truthful and honest to all parties to the transaction. But if I'm a dual agent, now I have a fiduciary duty of loyalty to both sides. It involves good faith. It, the idea that you know, you're gonna act in good faith, you're gonna do your best, you're gonna put your client's interest primary uh, in every transaction, um, and you're gonna maintain a confidentiality. Uh, th there are limits. On, on confidentiality, you're not required to disclose to the other side information uh, uh, about certain things. But again, you are required to pass on all material information. So you, you're going to have to judge when something is confidential, usually revolving around your client's financial position, what they're willing to take, what they're willing to pay, what the motivation for buying or selling is. Those are the kinds of things you can keep confidence. And that duty of confidentiality is in perpetuity. Um, so again, it is an obligation to basically put your client's interest first and, and act with the utmost care uh, and loyalty. Uh, there are jury instructions that talk about this. Uh, they are very clear and concise and, and essentially uh, come down to uh, a couple of, of factors. Uh, number one, uh, what is the what are the facts of that particular transaction? 
Uh, every transaction is going to be a little bit different. So what are the facts that um, are important in this transaction? How are you going to dig them out? How are you going to represent your client properly? Um, what's your client's deal? Are they experienced? Are they sophisticated? Are they first-time homebuyers? Are they uh, somewhat undereducated? Are they knowledgeable? Are they culturally restricted in some way? Or uh, do they have language issues? So, you know, what's the knowledge and experience of, of your client? What kinds of questions is your client asking? You know, are they uh, make sure that you document those questions and answer them as truthfully as you can. Sometimes the best answer for a, a, a client in a fiduciary situation is, I don't know let's go find out or let's talk to an expert and let's see if we can find out the answer to your question. But it's important you listen to those questions because that's a critical issue. What kind of property are we talking about? Is it unusual property, property near a floodplain, a fire zone? Uh, is it a property that is part of a tract? Is it a property that has multiple uses and is zoned for different uses, what's the nature of the property? And then are the terms of the sale uh, complicated? Is it all cash? Is there financing involved? What's the terms of the financing gonna be? What, what are the pitfalls? What are the other issues in terms of timing? What are the, the terms relative to, is somebody going to be making repairs or paying some brokerage fees uh, on behalf of the buyer or, some closing costs. What are the terms of the sale and how does that impact you and your obligations uh, to the client? Um, again, you're always acting in accordance with the code of ethics, which means you put your client's interest first. Uh, you, you don't accept information, again, without verifying it or passing it along and making it crystal clear probably in writing, that you have not verified uh, the information. Um, the, the fiduciary duty has with it uh, a responsibility to do some form of investigation, maybe to the point where you then tell your client, you know what, uh, we need to get a, a specific type of, uh, of an expert in, could be a surveyor, could be a lawyer, could be a tax person, wh whatever it is, but again, it's a duty to investigate and advise. It's 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 a uh, when when you fail to make these kinds of disclosures, it's going to lead to to lawsuits. Um, a lot of times, a good friend of mine, who's a plaintiff's lawyer, made the comment that he treats these matters the way he would treat a parent to a child. You know, the parent takes care of the child. The parent makes sure that the child is is well taken care of and has what it needs in order to uh, move forward and, and, and all of that. So again, there, there's a lot going on in terms of what the duty is, okay? And we have lots of resources, it's generally a matter of law. So you take, it's kind of like a jambalaya, you take the law that says you have an obligation of care, of loyalty, of confidentiality, of competence and all that. And then you take the facts you know, the, is, is the buyer a first time home buyer? Is the property complicated? Are the terms complicated? You mesh them all together and there is your obligation. That is your fiduciary duty. Well, how do you breach it? Um, again, uh, a lot depends upon who you're representing. Are you the listing broker? And if so, who is the duty owed to? Is it owed to the owner, to an entity? Um, is the entity a large entity, a small entity? Is it a trust? Who do you owe the duty to? Same question for the buyer. Who is the purchaser? What if you are a dual agent and you have a fiduciary obligation to both? So, um, and then lastly, before I jump into breach, how does it start and how does it end? That, that question is getting a little more complicated as we move down the road. Generally speaking, the law says that uh, you have to have an agency disclosure, which is sort of the official form, either before you take a listing or before you write up an offer. But those are the last days. And so 
Uh, very often, if you're working with a seller to try and set the price, to try and strategize the best time to put, pretty up, to put the property on the market and how you would go about doing all that, um, it may begin actually earlier because that client is relying on you. Now we have the, the new buyer broker forms and a lot of people are signing those forms before they even start showing. Now, when you do that, of course, you're providing an agency disclosure. So there's a solid argument that the fiduciary duty starts well before you ever write up an offer for that client. You are already acting in a principal agency relationship. Uh, and again, uh, is it a single agency? Is it a dual agency? All of those kinds of issues are, are critical. How is the duty breached? Well, take a look at the jury instruction. Take a look at what we've already talked about. Falling below the sort of mythical standard of care, right? There's going to be an expert if there's a, a lawsuit who's going to testify that in uh, your jurisdiction, the standard of care is such and so, such and so. If it's the plaintiff's lawyer, they're going to testify you fell below the standard of care. You didn't meet that minimum level of competency, that minimum level of service. If it is um, the defendant's expert, they're probably going to testify that you did or you were prevented from doing so for various factors. Um, so it's a question of fact. It's also a question of law. Expert opinions are going to be provided each way. And the real question is going to be, did your conduct uh, meet the, the, the standards of competency expected of a real estate professional handling either residential or commercial real estate? And then lastly, uh, was it a substantial cause of the harm that the um, plaintiff, either the buyer who is the primary plaintiff in these cases, or the seller, uh, is your conduct a substantial cause of that harm? And then what are the damages? What's it going to cost? Well, the damages are measured in a whole number of different ways. Number one is, was there constructive fraud? In other words, how badly did you breach your duty? Was it, was it something where there was just a real lack of effort on your part to do the job you were hired to do? Is it something that falls sort of in the, in the, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I made that error or I omitted to do something I knew I should have done. And then it's measured in different ways. It can be measured by the diminished value of the property. You know, the fact that you should have known or indicated something and because you didn't know, you didn't properly investigate, you didn't properly disclose, uh, the property isn't worth what your client paid for it because of your shortcoming. Another way that we measure damages is the cost of repair, right? The, the, that you failed to, dis, to discover something. And as a result, the client was forced to tear down a, a room, was forced to make repairs. And then the biggie, which was set up in a case many years ago called Salahuddin. And in that case, the court held that if there um, was a breach of the fiduciary duty and it was su substantial or significant, the measure of damages would be the expected uh, 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 constructive benefit of the bargain. So let me give you an example in Salahuddin. Mr. and Mrs. Salahuddin had come from another country and the country that they came from, uh, they were not allowed to own real estate. So owning a piece of property that they could then uh, uh, provide to their heirs, a, a two children, was very, very significant to them. So they wanted a property that at some point um, could be subdivided between the two children. And in the particular jurisdiction up north, a town called Hollister, I believe, uh, the, the uh, requirements at that particular point for this particular property were that it'd be a minimum of one acre. And of course, uh, the Salahutans were only looking for property that was a minimum of one acre because that's they had to have at least that much to be able to subdivide. Well, the realtor uh, found a piece of property, uh, according to him,
based on information he had not verified from another source, um, the, the property was over an acre. And as a result, the property was uh, uh, in a position to be subdivided at some point. Um, they went out and looked at the property and the property had fencing and based on an, uh, a, a view of the property. And again, this particular agent was very experienced, looked at the property and said, well, yeah, there's no question that this property is more than one acre. Well, that fence was encroaching. And in fact, the property, as it turned out at some juncture down, down the line, turned out to be only 0.85 acres. Now, most of us understand that if you can take a piece of property and subdivide it, the individual portions are going to be that more valuable than if you cannot subdivide and the property has a certain value. So let's make believe that this property had a, a value undivided of $200,000. But if you could subdivide it and sell each uh, uh, piece separately, uh, it would be worth $140,000. So that would mean it's worth $80,000 more subdivided than it would be in its, in its uh, position as one, one un, undivided unit. And that's what the court held, that the uh, real estate company was obligated to pay the damages to the Salahutans uh, in the amount of uh, the, the uh, extra $80,000 plus damages because uh, the material facts uh, uh, indicated that these people couldn't subdivide and it ended up costing that real estate office a significant amount of money. So you got to be careful. Uh, we've got a lot of cases, not, not too many of them actually favor the real estate industry. Um, if you are a fiduciary because you represent the seller and it's the seller filing the claim or you represent the buyer and it's the buyer filing the claim or you have dual fiduciary responsibility because you and or your office, remember the broker is a fiduciary to every client in the office. So even if they're separate agents, there's still a fiduciary obligation to both the buyer and the seller. It's a, it's a common problem. Uh, frankly, if you, if you do the best you can, document your file, understand your obligations, tell the truth, um, more than likely you'll be in pretty good shape. Well, until my next rant, uh, this is John Giardinelli, Association Counsel. Uh, signing out. Thank you very much for attending today.